Welcome to Diagnostic Imaging's Weekly Scan. I'm Senior Editor Whitney Palmer. Before we get to our featured interview this week with Dr. Murray Revner about the disadvantages African American women experience with breast cancer screening, here are the top stories of the week. Last week, JAMA Cardiology published a study revealing that 15% of competitive athletes had evidence of myocarditis on cardiac MRI scans after recovering from COVID-19. The news is certainly concerning and has pushed many in healthcare to investigate these findings further, but the results of the study, which included asymptomatic patients, also caught the attention of a cadre of experts from cardiology, diagnostic imaging, and general medicine. And they are worried the investigation's outcome could lead clinicians down a questionable path. In an open letter to the American College of Radiology, the Radiological Society of North America, and the European Society of Radiology, and more than a dozen other professional organizations. This group requested that the professional societies craft and publish guidance that does not recommend the use of cardiac MRI in patients who are asymptomatic for COVID-19. Ohio State cardiologist, Dr. Matthew Tong, who was involved in the JAMA cardiology study, spoke with diagnostic imaging, and he agreed that these concerns are not unfounded and that there is a need for more data to enable direct comparisons. The important thing he stressed is to continue to investigate this problem. In addition to cardiac imaging, abdominal radiologists should also keep their eyes open for signs of COVID-19. That's according to a study published this week in abdominal radiology. According to investigators from the University of Alberta, 18% of patients who end up testing positive for the virus first present with complaints of appetite loss, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal gas. In fact, 16% of patients only show those symptoms. For their study, the researchers analyzed 36 articles published between March 31st and July 15th of this year. In that review, they identified the most common findings as small and large bowel wall thickening, fluid-filled colon, pneumatosis intestinalis, pneumoperitoneum, intussusception, and ascites. And in most cases, radiologists only caught these as incidental findings in the base of the lungs that show up on abdominal CT scans. So if you're examining an abdominal scan, be on the lookout for evidence that might help you diagnose a COVID-19 positive patient. And once again this week, investigators turned their eyes to how the pandemic is continuing to affect you and your colleagues. In a study published in the European Journal of Radiology, a team from France showed that many of you are still experiencing insomnia, anxiety, and depression brought on by the continued outbreak. Based on an anonymous survey conducted from April 10th to April 19th of this year with responses from 1,515 radiologists, the team found that more than one third of providers are struggling with these issues. In particular, 40.9% reported having trouble sleeping, 35% said that they had symptoms of anxiety, and 30.6% wrestled with depression. Between 12% and 15% self-report that these issues were clinically significant. Radiologists in all care environments said that they experienced these problems to some degree, but those in private practice were most affected. It's possible, the team said, that substantial drops in workload led to a reduced sense of usefulness, as well as worries about financial stability. It's also important to note, the team said, that these added feelings of stress and anxiety have compounded the already heavy sense of burnout that many providers in radiology were already dealing with prior to the pandemic. In non-COVID-19 news, lung cancer screening guidelines could be overlooking African-American smokers who are at risk for developing the disease. This sounds an alarm bell because African-Americans have a higher incidence of and worse outcomes from lung cancer. In a study published in the Journal of the American College of Radiology, researchers from Cook County Health and Northwestern University in Chicago shared evidence that the 30-pack year threshold used to determine which patients should undergo low-dose CT screening could be too high. They found that while African Americans might smoke the same number of years as their white counterparts, they aren't actually smoking as many packs a day. So they're closer to a 20 pack year threshold. Based on their review of CT scans from 784 current and former smokers, the team determined African Americans had an incidence of lung cancer of 2.5%, while their white counterparts experienced 1.9%. And when looking at lung cancer diagnosis in the context of smoking, African-American participants were the only race to receive a cancer diagnosis when they had a pack year history below 30. Specifically, 30 pack year smokers had an incidence of 2.2% 2 
and those with less than 30, it was 2.7%. Based on these results, the team recommended changing the lung cancer screening threshold from 30 pack years to 20 pack years. And finally this week, Diagnostic Imaging spoke with Dr. Murray Rebner, Professor of Diagnostic Radiology and Molecular Imaging at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. He is also the Director of the Division of Breast Imaging in Beaumont Health System, as well as the President of the Society of Breast Imaging. He spoke with us about his latest research published in the Journal of Breast Imaging that examines the many obstacles and disadvantages that African American women face when it comes to being properly screened for breast cancer in a timely manner. Here's what he had to say. Well, I appreciate your taking some time to talk with me today. Thank you so much. Glad to do it. Um, well, to kind of start out, before we even jump into the details of the study and the work that you did, when we think about breast cancer screening and women, what do we first need to understand about the differences in how breast cancer impacts African American women and, and white women? Uh, there are several things that we need to keep in mind when we compare African American women to white women. First of all, uh, even though white women are slightly more likely to get breast cancer over their lifetime than African American women, African American women have a 40% higher mortality rate than white women, which is quite significant. And when you look back to 1990, the breast cancer mortality rates have dropped significantly. They've come down 40% for white women, but they've only come down 26% for African American women. So the benefit is there, but it's certainly not as good as we'd like to see in African American women compared to white women. The other thing we need to realize is that certain types of breast cancer, most notably the very aggressive, what we call triple negative cancers, occur twice as often in African-American women than white women, and they're also more likely to be diagnosed at a young point in the patient's lives, uh, and therefore they tend to be uh, more aggressive, and the effect on someone who's got more life years ahead of them is more significant, obviously, than a woman in her 70s or 80s. So uh, also from a genetic standpoint, uh, um, African-American women are twice as likely to have the BRCA gene than white women, not counting uh, European Jewish women. They're a separate group. But if you look at all white women, African-American women are twice as likely to have the BRCA gene. And because of all these things, because of the uh, higher incidence of aggressive breast cancer in the younger African-American population, you know, we recommend that all organizations, not just some, recommend that African-American women start screening with mammography at age 40 and that they do it annually because we don't want to miss some of these aggressive cancers by waiting too long. And the other thing is we're, the American College of Radiology is recommending for all women that they have a risk assessment, meaning what is their lifetime risk of getting breast cancer before they turn 30? Because for some of the gene positive patients who are BRCA positive, we actually recommend starting to screen those patients with MRI at age 25. So it's important that women know their risk and they know it at an early age so they may benefit from supplemental screening. So then with all of that as a, as a backdrop and, and continuing down the discussion of, of screening, um, what is, I guess, the, the reality of the situation right now when it comes to African-American women being screened, the, the likelihood that they're actually going to follow some of these guidelines that you just kind of walked us through? Well, unfortunately, the compliance rate is much lower in the African-American population. They're, depending upon what study you read, they're 70 to 80% less likely to get screened than white women. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the, the primary one, we think, is that they're not hooked up with a primary care doctor. And, uh, you know, they need to be told not just for breast cancer, but other uh, illnesses that are more common in their, in their uh, population, like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. They need to be plugged into the uh, appropriate uh, screening uh, guidelines and therapies in order that they benefit from these programs. So that's one thing is they don't have a primary care doctor. The other thing is uh, there may be some pain, some embarrassment in getting a mammogram. 
also the socioeconomic factors behind that, even though, you know, there are uh, laws that f um, mandate that women have free screening mammograms, what happens if you have a positive one? They don't cover diagnostic mammograms. And then what if you need surgery or treatment if you have breast cancer? All those other things become very, very expensive and far more expensive than the mammogram itself. So a lot of women, you know, don't want to run that route because they just can't afford to do it. So, you know, these are all reasons why we think that African American women are not partaking as much in screening as we would like them to. All right. So then walk me through you know, what your, your motivation was or your intent was with this study. You know, what, what did you look at? Who did you include? And, and how did you go through the investigative process with this? Well, uh, it was almost a year and a half ago, uh, 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 Dr. Jennifer Harvey, who's a friend of mine, and she's now also the editor of the Journal of Breast Imaging, which is a new journal that uh, is affiliated with the Society of Breast Imaging. Uh, we met at a meeting and she regularly wants to publish articles related to screening. So she asked me if I would be willing to write an article. And originally we had this broad scope of a topic that would deal with socioeconomic factors, with uh, risks of screening, benefits of screening, and it became too work intensive to do that. So uh, after many iterations, we decided it would be better to focus right now just on the African American population, because we knew that they were disadvantaged and we wanted to see why some of the uh, things that were happening to them were occurring with you know, higher morbidity, uh, less partaking of screening mammography, et cetera. So, you know, we discussed all that. I asked one of my colleagues, Dr. Vidya Pai, who I work with uh, at my institution to work with me on the project. And uh, we decided to make a thorough review of the medical literature and find out what's been written about this and what is the data that supports encouraging African-American women to be screened more often. You know, are they at an increased risk for breast cancer at a younger age? You know, do they have predisposing conditions like being genetically positive for the disease that puts them at risk? So, you know, all these factors played into our thorough review of the literature and our deciding to just focus on this one particular group. All right. So then in particular, when it comes to looking at these impacts on, on African American women, and like you said, you know, there's, there are reasons why they are not getting screened, but overall, and this might seem like a bit of an obvious question, the consequences of, of not being screened or not having access, you know, what is, what is this population experiencing, you know, on, a, on an annual basis or throughout their lifetime? Well, we, we always think about mortality, and that's a huge factor. 40% uh, higher mortality in the African-American population compared to the white population. But there's also the issue of morbidity, not just mortality. If breast cancers go undetected, then the treatment that's necessary to help these women becomes far more extensive. If they, and African-American women are more often diagnosed at later stages, so they may require for instance, not just a lumpectomy and hormone therapy, but they may need uh, chemotherapy, they may need radiation therapy, and uh, they might also need more extensive therapies, uh, not just one, to treat their disease. And that adds up to a significant impact on their ability to function in society as either a spouse, a mother, uh, a member of the uh, workforce, all these things take its toll. And it's also, you know, from a dollars and cents standpoint, financially far more expensive to treat these patients with all these extra therapies than it would be if they were diagnosed at an earlier stage and could receive potentially just one treatment that would take care of everything. Gotcha. So then based on that, what are the recommendations or at least some of the suggestions that we could point to that, that can be done to you know, make screening more available for these women, um, at least alert them that this is something that they need to do or avenues to where they can you know, have access to, to the providers and the imaging services that they need? Well, I think the most important thing is education. I think that 
the women themselves need to understand, number one, they may be at increased risk. Overall, they are. For one particular woman, it's difficult to say, but as a group, they are at increased risk. We talked about the 40% higher mortality rate, the risk that they're gonna be diagnosed later, the risk that they're gonna be higher for the BRCA gene. So all these things suggest that you know, the women themselves know that they are at increased risk. And there've been studies that show that African-American women tend to perceive their own risk much lower than white women. So that's one of the reasons why they don't often ask for supplemental screening like MRI if they're BRCA positive. It's not so much a denial, it's probably more a function of education and they're just not knowing or not thinking that they could be affected by breast cancer. So that's, that's one thing. So we think that education, as I mentioned before, having uh, risk assessment done by the time no later than age 30 to benefit from supplemental screening if they're candidates for it. And also because of the BRCA possibility, genetic counseling. These women may need to speak to a genetic counselor to understand how this is going to affect not just them, but potentially their sisters, their daughters, other members of their own family. So that's important to think of as well. We also think it's important that other organizations strongly consider changing some of their guidelines to recommend annual screenings starting at age 40. You know, there are organizations like the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the American College of Radiology, uh, the American uh, uh, Congress of OBGYN doctors, they do that and we think that's terrific. But some groups like the family practitioners, the uh, internists, the US Preventive Service Task Force, you know, they just say start at 50 and leave it up to the individual to consider 40. And when you look at this data, if you were you know, to say that to African American women, with what we know about highly aggressive cancers occurring twice as likely in that population under the age of 50, you know, we're going to be missing a lot of breast cancer and perhaps having a lot of women die unnecessarily because these guidelines weren't more tied in. And all of these organizations admit that starting screening annually at age 40 saves the most lives. It's in their own uh, written reports, but because they think the so-called harms of screening outweigh the benefits, they say don't start at age 40. And to me, that's mind boggling. What are the harms? Anxiety, well, women can't tolerate anxiety about getting a bad diagnosis. What about men and prostate cancer? I mean, why they're tougher than we are, we know that. <laughs> they give birth. <laughs> so they certainly can tolerate that. The other thing uh, for, in terms of uh, is being called back. Well, the callback rate is only about 10%. And most often it involves a couple extra pictures, either being told you're normal or come back and see me in six weeks because there's something that's very low suspicion that I want to follow. And then the third thing is this thing that everyone's placing so much focus on these days, overdiagnosis. And what that means is that we're gonna find the cancer in their breast that over their lifetime is not gonna do them any harm. Now I can say categorically that that number is exceedingly, exceedingly low, way under 10%. And it's a very hard thing to measure overdiagnosis. And also, you know, the benefits of doing all the things we talked about, finding cancer early, you know, you know being able to treat uh, patients' morbidity, not just impact their mortality, you know, less extensive therapies, all these things far outweigh the theoretical risk of a few cases of cancer being diagnosed that wouldn't affect a woman. So, you know, getting organizations to sign on to these things that will recommend annual screening starting at age 40 is also uh, very important as well. So those are the main things I think, you know, when you talk about recommendations, organizations, uh, education of women, also their, their doctors. I mean, their primary care doctors need to be plugged into this information as well and not just take what, like, like I said, from the internist's association, the family practice started 50 and then, you know, it's a reflex. They get it from their head organization and they go ahead and do it without thinking about what are some of the ramifications of doing that. So these are all things I think that could be done to improve the situation. 
Well, just out of curiosity, and this may be something that um, that you know about or not, but but bringing up the the knowledge that these organizations have that forty really is better than fifty. Is there a a movement or a push within these groups to kind of make their own recommendations earlier, or to to do any type of of um, I guess recasting of what they recommend, or is that something that's just not in the conversation right now? I don't think it's that much in the conversation within their own groups. I know there's a lot of conversation among different groups uh, to have this happen. Uh, but, you know, there are lots of things involved here. There are uh, egos that are involved in terms of why we think we know better than you do. Uh, there are also what they consider financial ramifications and how they place importance upon different factors. In our opinion, our job is to save lives. That's why I went into radiology. You know, cancer screening for breast cancer saves lives. We know that. It doesn't work in a lot of other areas, pancreatic cancer, dismal results. It's starting to work in lung cancer. But for a long time, breast cancer was the poster child for you know, the type of tumor that if you find it early, you can help benefit mortality. So uh, I think that a lot of these organizations, you know, need to focus on saving lives and not so much on the economics or the intellectual uh, egotism of uh, some of these issues. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about the impact on, on the individual woman herself, but pivoting a little bit to how radiologists can use the findings and, and the information that you present in your study, what do providers need to keep in mind when we're talking about getting these breast cancer screening services to African-American women, you know, be it talking to their uh, referring provider colleagues or even to the patients themselves, you know, what can they glean from what you've published and potentially use for a more positive clinical impact? Uh, I think they need to be aware of the data that supports, you know, screening younger African American women annually. Uh, a lot of them, I'm sure, don't realize that these higher aggressive tumors occur in the young African American population twice as often as in the Caucasian population. Uh, I think they need to know um, in our reports that we communicate to them that we do recommend, you know, getting a, a risk assessment by the age of 30, uh, perhaps, you know, not tie their hands, but at least suggest the possibility that these women, if they are uh, potentially going to benefit from supplemental screening, consider it. Uh, I think we need to educate them about what the ramifications of them not doing that are. The data, if you look at what we've published, says, higher mortality, higher morbidity, um, more likely to be diagnosed at late stage, not to benefit from less extensive therapies. All these things have a negative impact on their patient population. And if they were to uh, take heed and plug themselves into some of these recommendations for their African-American patients, th they're doing them a great service. So I think, uh, it's about communication, education. You know, radiologists, people used to think, you know, we're like uh, a bat or a mole. We hide in the dark and uh, we never see this the light of day. But nowadays, you know, the focus is on um, being out there to talk to patients. You know, in breast imaging, we see patients, you know, who have abnormal screening studies come in with lumps. We're interfacing with them all the time. And I take that opportunity to try to, in the small amount of time I have with the patient, educate them about not just, you know, what they're there for at that time. You no, know, those are things, you know, in terms of, you know, educating the patient, educating the referring physician, the clinician, uh, nurse practitioner, et cetera, are all going to make a difference. And like I said, you know, really the patient needs to take ownership of her own health care and be an advocate for herself. As I said, if they're not raising these issues, if her primary care doctor is not bringing these up, she should raise them in the office and say, hey, I'm African-American. I understand I could be at increased risk for getting a highly aggressive cancer. When I'm, uh, what should we do about that? What do you think? You know, at least generate a discussion. And if the primary care doctor uh, isn't conversant about that, then he or she needs a young person because this is uh, an important issue for their patient's health. Absolutely. 
Um, well, then to just kind of round this out, is there anything else about the study, you know, as far as implications are concerned for uh, the healthcare industry in general or, or for women that we have not touched on that you think would be important to include to kind of give folks a, a comprehensive idea of the importance of this work? Uh, so I, the only other thing that we really didn't spend a lot of time on is, um, you know, financial support for having the situation improved. And, you know, when you think about uh, the African American population, certainly socioeconomic status comes into play. You know, we didn't focus on that a lot in our paper. Uh, we mentioned it kind of in passing, but, you know, we think that things like uh, having um, free transportation to get to uh, imaging clinics to get these patients plugged in to see a referring physician, you know, to have monies available for them if they are diagnosed with a problem on their screening mammogram and they need additional workup and perhaps even surgery and treatment to make these funds available. So, and rural patients, what about women who live out, you know, uh, on farms who are African American? You know, there are not that many, but there are some, you know, and not just African American women, but people of lower socioeconomic status who are not in the city. You know, transportation, education, all these things factor in in terms of what uh, philanthropic organizations and government can do to help these women. Uh, get educated and plugged into a system where they can receive the proper care that they need. All right. Well, Dr. Remner, I appreciate your taking the time today. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure speaking with you. You as well.